Hi everyone, and welcome again to my audiovisual channel. I am Gabriella Handel, a draftsman and the host of this show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I bring you episode 46, and I will have this conversation with artist Zane York. If you'd like to support this podcast, liking and sharing this video is a great way to do it, and so is subscribing. These forms of support are immediate and have no additional cost. If you want to support the podcast with money, that is also welcome. And you can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, from the Contemporary, contemporary Figurative Art website where I have a, sele a selection of drawings, buying stuff I make from eBay, buying prints of my drawings, or leaving a tip. The links for these things are in the show notes. Thank you very much for watching and or listening and enjoy the episode. Okay, so Zane York, welcome to my podcast, A Conversation About Art. You are episode 46. Please tell our listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Sure. Uh, my name is Zane York. Uh, I am a painter who lives in Brooklyn. Uh, I'm also a teacher. Uh, I work at New York Academy of Arts and also uh, at RISD. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, did you say you're a painter? I am a painter indeed, yes. Okay. I also do a lot of drawing, of course, uh, along the way. Uh, and honestly, I have a background in sculpture too from my, my undergrad days. I spent a lot of time working, uh, doing bronze foundry work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when did you start painting? and drawing uh, let's see so drawing is something that's been with me for ages uh, i grew up in a family with a mom who was an artist she was a calligrapher watercolorist uh, oil painter occasionally so it was always around me and my brothers uh, i'm the youngest of four my two older brothers are both uh, uh comic book fans uh fanboys mm -hmm. uh, so i grew up with comics and that was a big part of my childhood so from an early age, I was actually teaching myself to draw, basically doing copies of different illustrations I would see in comic books, uh, really with the goal of becoming a comic book artist down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of the initial inroad for me in many ways. Uh, from that, went on to undergrad, uh, went from focusing on drawing and illustration specifically to fine art more, I guess, one way or another. Slowly uh, got more interested in painting and sculpture due to some some great mentors at the school I was at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so undergrad is uh, like, like in your 20s, early 20s? Uh, ending in my early 20s, really. So uh, yeah, I mean, I right out of high school, you know, I go on to um, I'm a child of the Midwest, so I grew up like Nebraska, Iowa, Minnesota, went to school for college uh, in University of Wisconsin, Oshkosh. Mm -hmm. So I was there, uh, finished with my, my degree there in drawing, painting, and sculpture, I think when I was 21. Started, for, uh, started at New York Academy of Art uh, in the master's program there uh, in 2001 as well, and finished in, in 2003. Okay. Um so, so, um, did you get into painting because of those teachers that you said that you consider mentors? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was first introduced to me by my mother. She uh, had set up a, an easel in our house, uh, and I had shown a little bit of an interest, and so I started tooling around with some oil paint she had laid out for me. Uh, but that was that was a quick uh, exercise in disinterest for me. Uh, you know, I tried it a couple times. Didn't like the lack of control it had because I was, you know, a precise drawer at the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I liked control and I, I wasn't mature enough, I don't think, at the time to really appreciate the medium as it was. Um, so when I went to undergrad, started as a drawing major. Uh, I had uh, a terrific instructor, Li Hu, uh, who has since passed, uh, but he uh, learned in the Chinese Academy and he was a drawing teacher, uh, but he wanted to teach painting as well. He was a painter himself. And so he would teach from the standpoint of drawing, not just for its sake, but also as preparation and an understanding for painting. Mm -hmm. So he slowly started to uh, take more and more influence over me. Uh, and, and I slowly started to move into a painting major. Uh, and then of course I had a sculpture instructor who also got me involved in sculpture so much. 
Okay, so so the reason for which you turned away from it at the at first when your when your mom showed you the materials of oil painting uh, versus when you were like slowly kind of weaned into it in undergrad by this teacher um, was it really was it only the feeling that you couldn't control the medium or was there do you think there was something else like what do you think what else do you think changed or what sparked what do you think sparked the interest like what tickled your fancy about the <laughs> your curiosity about paint about painting with oil I mean, largely it was it was goals on some level, because when I was younger, uh, you know, again, comic book illustration was what I was interested in, although I appreciated, uh, you know, seeing paintings in museums, uh, you know, going to the Art Institute of Chicago on rare occasion, I'd, I'd be able to see, you know, a lot of beautiful works, but it wasn't really my focus. My focus was on drawing, illustration, uh, and so that's what I was hoping to gain. And when I kind of showed a little bit of interest in oil painting, it really kind of I moved away from it quick because I wasn't using it. I was kind of using it more as an illustration, you know, tool rather than painting? using it as, as yeah, rather than trying to use it as painting because I just didn't really have an understanding of what it was. Uh, and so, you know, it was just kind of a, it was like two little quick paintings basically, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and I couldn't control it. And I, I, you know, was a very uptight Midwestern boy at heart, still am. And so that was very frustrating for me. Um, mm -hmm. Then, uh, as, as I started to go into undergrad, uh, really got exposed to it more, really gained more of an appreciation for the process and technique, you know, that's where it started to take hold. That's where my focus started to shift towards, you know, uh, towards painting, sculpture, and, and I guess more of the fine art as, as it's uh, kind of referred mm -hmm. to. Okay, but, um, all right, I mean, I would like, I, I would like it if you elaborated more about this control um, that that you that you speak of because I mean it's like you know you're I understand the idea of being precise with drawing because you have like a solid point of a of the pencil you sharpen it you make it point pointier but it's like I don't know it's solid and you can like directly like a laser point it at an area and then you know work with that um, but then you know your paintings are like super punctilious say you know um, and you know. It, arguably you could kind of like make a connection with the with, uh, between that and like the alleged uptightness that you talk about so then it's like what I don't know I mean I guess I would like it if you went more into the control aspect because it's like what was it that you couldn't control before that you obviously can now you know uh sure so um yeah, I guess, uh, you know, initially with drawing, and I think this is something, you know, I, I'm going to be bringing in some, some you know, kind of language and understanding from teaching as well. Yeah, uh, But basically, when drawing, when I, was, when I was first learning to draw, it was a matter of controlling, of delineation, right? Really mm -hmm. looking for a line that describes the contour of a form. But I wasn't even thinking in terms of form at that point. I was thinking more in terms of just creating muscles that looked like muscles on a superhero, right? Or whatever it may be. And so I started in a very, you know, superficial manner trying to utilize the language of line. Uh, and in that, you know, I would get very precious and focused on, you know, all of those details, right? Trying to really, you know, get it just perfect and not really utilizing kind of a calligraphic touch, not really utilizing any kind of, of real sophistication or understanding of the larger picture. Um, you know, and I think that's something that's that's just kind of that naive start starting point for a lot of people, where they really want that control and that that ability to make something just look perfect. You know, you know, there, there's always kind of like people who will bring up the the idea of oh, this person's a great draft person because they can draw a circle and it looks perfect. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just absolute bullshit. It's like mm -hmm. that that is the least interesting thing is is just that mechanical control. Yeah, it's it's part of it, but more of it is really you know having insight and probity with what you're doing and, and directing it towards something, some sort of vision, right? So that control is, is the starting point. I've worked my whole way uh, up to this point and still battle with that, that aspect of my personality, of wanting to control line and, and be really tight about stuff. And it's one of those things that I know is a part and parcel of my, my being, and it's not going to go away fully but I can control it and utilize it when I want to and know to override it when I, when I want to as well for different effects and paintings. 
And so there's a level of sophistication that kind of comes along with that. You know, and one of the things uh, moving from drawing to painting that I think is always really tough and was definitely the experience I had uh, way back uh, when, when I tried it for the first time was knowing that drawing informs painting, but painting is not drawing. It is, it's a, a wholly different animal. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to paint, there is a certain level of, of building things, you know, building the painting surface without worrying about line. You're arriving at line and contour later, typically in a painting. It's not a starting point. You start with approximations and kind of build yourself towards refinement. Mm -hmm. And that that lesson was hard to learn when I was younger because I just wanted that that precision at, mm -hmm. at the start. Yes, I see. Okay. Um, okay, so then Would you say that's the main difference between painting and drawing? Or yeah. uh, an important difference between the two, at least? Um, well, I mean, when when I kind of moved into that and had that realization about painting, um, you can also, you know, that kind of comes back and, and also informs drawing for me. Mm. So, you know, it's a distinction that I made when I kind of realize that, that you can't really paint the way that you, you draw if you're just kind of going in there and trying to delineate from the beginning. You know, it doesn't tend to work great in oil painting. It can, you know, there's exception to every rule, it's art, right? It's the wild west as far as that goes. But ultimately there's, uh, you know, this, this feeling of, of kind of openness in painting, but that comes back to drawing. And the funny thing for me is, is that when I discovered ballpoint pen drawing, uh, which I've done for quite a while, that to me, despite the fact that it is a, a, a tool that is supposed to be very linear, right? It's mm -hmm. supposed to be very distinct. Once you lay it down, it stays down. For me, I utilized it in a completely different method. It's something that is more atmospheric and I arrive at line at the very end of the drawing, typically. I'm building tone through soft and subtle, you know, cross hatching essentially, uh, and then slowly start to build out these forms and then make delineations really further down the line in the drawing. And that's, you know, really informed by my painting and my ability to kind of override that that need for delineation early on in my career, mm -hmm. uh, which I like to think has served me well along the way. <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, I, I definitely understand the aspect that you're talking about, uh, at, about um, arriving at delineation or arriving at the preci precision rather than worrying about it from the beginning uh, or having that be your main concern right from the beginning because uh, for example like um, that's something that I learned actually at the academy when I started using charcoal I hadn't used charcoal before um, I, I started using it at the academy and um, there's something uh, something about the charcoal even when it's in a pencil or something that it just feels really rough and uh, it like that feeling of roughness and carelessness or something like that sort of sort of like um it's kind of contagious or something when i start to use it and then i'm just like all right i'm just gonna um i've described it before as like a kamikaze sort of sort of feeling or like some or like the feeling that the vikings needed when they were going into war where they were like when they're berserk thing where it's just like it doesn't matter just just go um so it's something like that, and it's just like very unconcerned in the sense that even though I am making marks that are lines, line marks or like smudgy type stuff, um, it's still like searching for something, and it's like, you know, I start the the you know you start the search by make just making a shape, any shape, and then you uh, once uh, I start making like corrections, like I'll erase the thing and then make another line that feels closer to where it's supposed to be and then that procedure is just like over and over and over again until until it feels like the like the image is where it, it until it feels like the image looks like it's supposed to look and like is where it's supposed to be um so it your your description of building a painting and similarly with ballpoint reminds me of that which is i kind of understand it that way yeah absolutely uh and i couldn't agree more and and I think that's again, it, you know, early on in, in drawing, there's there's a preciousness, right? There's mm -hmm. this every line has to count and matter, you know, and that that becomes like this this limiting factor. And what you describe is, is also, you know, 
what I kind of think of is is kind of you start from chaos and you build order out of that mm-hmm. chaos in a mm-hmm. drawing or in a painting. And that that's very important because if you start by trying with order right away, you know, then then you're 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 kind of losing sight of some things, I think, along the way. So the exploration just isn't there quite the same. Uh, so when I'm when I'm thinking about, uh, uh, you know, that idea and and really kind of gaining a maturity as an artist, I think, in a lot of ways comes from that comfort of living in that chaos, living in, in you know, what I kind of refer to as the shit box, mm-hmm. where everything is kind of out of control. You don't know exactly what's happening next. And you have to find and fabricate order and, and build your way out of it somehow. But that's a beautiful journey, because in that mm-hmm. journey, that's where you actually have revelation and can really find your way, uh, you know, through a painting and find new insights. So, you know, that's that's the exhilaration on some level for me. Yeah, for sure. That's definitely um, find, finding finding the path like slowly and patiently and just, you know, being determined about it is like and, and you know, effectively finding the end, the whatever it is that one was looking for is extremely gratifying. And your uses of the terms chaos and order remind me of Jordan Jordan Peterson, who I really um, uh, I enjoy his lectures and convers uh, and conversations and like his podcast a lot. And he talks about chaos and order very much, uh, just very often. And um, he has talked about artists, and he says that artists we effectively go into the chaos and like make it civilized basically so that other people can come as well so so that's uh that's really cool uh that's that's just a really great way of putting it um in a previous episode also the um, an artist also referred to that very thing about how he just like makes like some splashy stuff on his uh canvas and then whatever whatever imagery he starts to see then that's what he starts to like develop in the drawing and so that is that is also um, because like the splashy stuff at first is the chaos, and so like then he's trying to create order by determining what he's seeing and like specifying. Oh, I see an eyeball here. I see a cloud here, like that kind of stuff. And he also described it like um, finding shapes in clouds, like when you look at about the sky, like that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. So I I find that description very uh, just very satisfying, and it makes a, makes a lot of sense because yeah, like searching you know you're searching for something that makes sense yeah absolutely and and this actually comes full circle back to my my mentors in undergrad uh lee who who i mentioned before uh his paintings were actually built that exact same way where he would essentially start off by just using a brush and and randomly sketching out onto the canvas lines all over the place and then he may turn it two or three different times look at it stare at it for a while and slowly start pulling out an image that he's he's you know imagining Mm-hmm. And using his his techniques uh, and tool set to to kind of develop a painting and construct a painting from that point. So it sounds very similar to this process that, that you you've mentioned. Uh, also, it kind of goes full circle because that chaos order thing comes back to another mentor of mine, and and he was an art history for, uh, uh, instructor, uh, and you know his his was much more on the philosophical mode, and so it, you know that goes all the way back to Plato. Uh, that quick chaos and order thing. So that's definitely uh, uh, I- embedded in my head as well. Yes, those are very very cool things to think about. Um, I've I've uh, recently started thinking about um, just this stuff, a critical thinking, and trying to just think a little bit longer about things. And it's 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 uh, and I'm, well, I mean, it's you know, it's uh, arguably perhaps it's similar to going into the chaos and uh, trying to find or make the order because it's like you know if 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 i have like an idea or like a phrase or something that i don't understand i have to like sit and be like all right what does it mean and then i'm like okay this means this and this means that and whatever and then and then i arrive at a thing that makes sense to me and that also is very gratifying even though it's not visual art and also you know like the way that we've been describing like the way that you described your teacher working and the way that i described the previous artist that i talked to his name is david michael wright um, I feel like in a way it's, uh, it's a, there seems to, I don't know how it works for you when you go to make work, but in my case, for example, like at least I ha- I start with a vague, with an idea of like, I have an kind of like an image in my mind's eye and then I try to find it on the paper. Uh, whereas I get the impression from 
the teacher you were talking about from Lee Hu and this artist that I talked to that um, um, they can't, maybe it's like a way of like embracing the chaotic aspect a little bit more because they because uh, I, I from what I understand it seems like they don't start with any specific idea like they kind of allow the the surface to sort of like tell them quote unquote you know what might be there sort of does that make sense yeah no and you know I think one thing that that I think many painters or, or many artists in general kind of have is there's a certain duality to the process, right? We have to select a subject matter. And in so selecting a subject matter, sometimes it's just essentially being used as an inroad for the exploration that we're going to make on the paper or canvas, right? Uh, and what comes out the other end may be a direct reflection of that initial you know, subject that we chose. Other times it may be completely unknown to the viewer. You know, it could be some kind of a personal thing that that really we we took from our for ourselves from our own experience, uh, based our imagery off of it. And it's unimportant that that imagery and our that that symbolism that that existed in our minds really is imbued into the viewer because it's kind of become something else along the way. Um, you know, so I, I think that that is something that can be very much uh, part of the process for a lot of different artists. You know, the subject, the actual visual, what it is, is really only a small part of the full scope of what painting is once we start to digest it as viewers. Mm. Yeah, so that's kind of like about the physical description of the image, like what is on the image versus what it might mean, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of dialogue back and forth about it, um, you know, and, and a lot of different artists who kind of look at it different ways, of course. Uh, you know, there's there's a, a book by James Elkins, uh, What Painting Is, which is a pretty famous, you know, uh, uh, art theory, art history book. Uh, and, and with that, you know, he kind of goes into this idea of painting as alchemy on some level. I mean, he goes into it quite extensively and a little bit too much, in my opinion. But there's a really beautiful kernel in that thinking, and that's that idea that a painting or a drawing is really the the subject of that drawing is not it's not possible to separate the subject of the drawing and the content of the drawing they are forever in, in uh, uh, intertwined right mm -hmm. so this idea that you know if rembrandt's working on a painting the feeling and and empathy and experience that he's bringing into that painting is imbued inside of the brushwork and so you can't just go Oh, well, this is a painting of Abraham, so it means this. Well, there's a lot of paintings of Abraham, but we don't have one, you know, that that's, you know, they aren't all Rembrandts, right? And so this process, this exploration in paint or, or charcoal or whatever it may be, uh, it really, that is so vital, at least to so much of what, you know, uh, I guess traditional art making is, and that idea of the handmade, right? It's this idea that that language is not just a, pictorial language in the sense of, of just image making. It is also, you know, the the process itself is is embedded inside of the overall content. Like the craft aspect of it. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, Vince Desiderio uh, talks about it a little bit. I know in the, uh, the book that he and Daniel Maidman had done, uh, the interview book, uh, you know, he talks a lot about that kind of content too. You know, just this idea that 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 process is so important for really building, uh, you know, some uh, a painting that's more than just you know that straight one note image, right? I guess the separation between what's more traditionally seen as an illustration and what's seen as as art or fine art, I guess. You know, it's a, they're they're arbitrary on some level, but at the same time, we know the difference between. Uh, you know, a painting that moves us, you know, to tears in a museum, if that's what happens, or a painting that you just kind of look at and go, eh, yeah, it's nice. You mm -hmm. know, so there, there's a big difference there. And so much of that comes down to, you know, the the artist's, uh, you know, um, sincerity towards pushing pushing their craft and understanding so much more about what, what they're trying to make and really imbuing that inside of, of, of the surface of, of the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what is art in your opinion? Uh, uh, well, okay. So art in, in my opinion, um, I don't, it's not necessarily my opinion, but I'll kind of give you, uh, I guess a rundown a little bit. Um, so I remember again, coming from that comic book background, 
I was reading a lot and actually even like as a freshman, I think, you know, like early on in my life, I started reading books on comic book theory and the theory of the art of comic books. And there's one that's, uh, you know, pretty critical uh, text, which is uh, Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. And in that, he tries to define art, right? And so in his trying to define art, which is such a slippery thing to try and do in general, uh, he basically does a, a, an illustration of a caveman running away from, I think it was like a lion or a bear or something mm -hmm. like that. And this idea that as he's running away and trying to survive this attack, he gets by by the skin of his teeth, it falls off a cliff or something, and he looks back and, you know, does like a na 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 na, -na kind of expression. And he says, that right there, that's art. And basically what he equates it to is this idea that anything that is done outside of, basically any expressions being made outside of, of the need of survival, essentially, is superfluous towards living, but colors our lives. And so at that very base level, that is something that is an, a language of art. Now, that's not high art, right? There's a huge difference there. And that's where we get into these long, you know, long, long conversations about really what's at, at the crux of what's important about art. You know, so there, there, it, it's a gigantic gray area. There's, there's cream that rises to the top and, and artists love to get together at a bar and, and, you know, sit around and have these conversations and more often than not, they're, they're poo-pooing other art or whatever it may be. And along that way, what's really happening is they're describing what they think is really at the heart of what they really love in art. And, you know, for me, when I, when I think about art, when I think about what moves me with art and, and, and everybody's different this way, but what really gets to me. And I think what, what, what I think is a relatively good uh, uh, taking off point for for it is that art is is essentially a reflection of the artist's understanding of reality. And that's really what the basis of it is. And then following that, of course, not everybody is going to be great at really expressing that, right? There's people who are, are highly profound at it. There are people who are very amateurish about it. There's all sc scopes there. Mm -hmm. So that comes down to kind of more of that, you know, again, going back to, to the, the early days with Aristotle, kind of that teleology, that idea of, well, if art is this, this scene is something where we're really trying to express our understanding of the world around us, of, of reality, how well does the art actually do that? And I think that we can see that in, in many pieces, you know, I can tell you right away why why a painting like uh, uh, Ribera's Clubfoot has such a profound in, uh, impact on me. And it may not have that same impact for somebody else because their experience of the world may be different and they're more compelled by different pieces. So for me, I, I like to keep a very broad idea of what art is, knowing that I have a very specific thing that I look for and that moves me with it. But I'm, I'm really interested in the conversations because you get to keep your ears open and you get to learn so much more when you're having these conversations about what other people think art is. And nine times out of 10, they're going to say something that you go, yeah, that fits too, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those things where it's such a broad, abstract you know, concept that there's exceptions to every rule, things that you don't consider, and you always find yourself opening up to new possibilities of what it is and what, what you know, we should really consider. Mm -hmm. um, Plato said something about how art should be like abolished or something. Am I am I off I'm, about that? Because I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no. I was going to say I'm no expert on what Plato said. <laughs> well, no. It's just that it's just that I I just finished reading the symposium and he wrote okay. this he wrote the symposium, um, and uh, there seems to be something in it about his opinion about art, about, yeah, art, because according, and it's just like the introduction, like I didn't even go reading any, um, like specifically about Plato, it's like the, the introduction written, written by like the translator of the, of the symposium or something that I, that I, that I have. Um, and so there's something about how art brings out the worst in people, uh, according to him, that's uh, what he said or something. Um, and he example he he gives the example of like a it's like a story or something about about a, a person walking by 
like a dead body or something and how the person just really wants to look at the dead body even though it's like repulsive or something and so the person this character that he's talking about in the story goes to the the dead body and he he like makes his gesture with his eyes to like open them and he's like all right just look at it then because it's like the eyes that want to look at the dead body or something so he so he equates that to are somehow doing something like that to the viewer something of the sort um and i guess aristotle didn't have that opinion about it um this reflecting of the artist's understanding of reality and i guess what you were saying about the all of the except exceptions and how lots of things fit into this or that i mean i i have the same issue when i try to think about what kind of stuff i generally like in a drawing for example just like uh phys physical characteristics like what kind of things do i enjoy looking at in the drawing and if i'm like all right i like um variety of marks i don't know to say something for example i mean i do like a variety of marks um lots of drawings that i like have that but then lots of drawings that i think are stupid also have that and, or drawings that i think are ugly or useless or whatever or pointless also have the characteristics so it's like i wonder how and why did we get to this point where art has no borders um for 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 me i mean you know before starting to try to fit to try to find some kind of just even the smallest anchor about what art might be. Um, before, I was like, with the whole, like, more postmodernist Duchamp type stuff, I was like, oh yeah, anything can be art. If you say that it's art, it's art, and that's it. And I was like, I mean, all right, I mean, I'm not crazy about that idea, but I suppose this is the modern world, I must put up with it and stuff, you know, but at the same time, it's like I had, a, like, a small inkling of a very traditional, quote-unquote, type idea about what art is, which is, you know, it's whatever it is, it, it's, you know, it must be on a paper, it must be on canvas, must be painted, must be a sculpture. And at the same time, lots of things that I think are a joke do not that do not deserve to be called art are also on those surfaces. So it's like, I don't know, it's kind of frustrating. So, I mean, how do you think we got, why do you think there's no, why do you think it's so vague? Why did it become so vague? Um... I, I can't speak towards why necessarily. I mean, there's been plenty of movements and counter movements and the dialogue really stems from that constant back and forth about what it is. I mean, even if you go back to like, you know, medieval to the Renaissance, the Renaissance is this grand area of humanism. And so we get figures that start to have more naturalism, have a different sensibility to them, sometimes divorcing fully from religion in certain areas, right? So that changes. And then you get to the Baroque and then you have, uh, you know, Caravaggio leading you into the Baroque. And then you have a whole nother reason. You get dirt underneath the fingernails. You get a, a you know a whole different kind of concept again about what art is doing. You, and then you like, keep rolling it forward, rolling it forward, rolling it forward, and you see you know there, there's a contrarianism on some level or a defiance on some level about art. And I think that's a great thing, mm -hmm. right? You know, we always have this dialogue. You know, uh, the impressionists you know fought back against late French Academy stuff, right? And that's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. And people may not love, you know, where we're at now these days, but it's chaos, right? We can find our own order out of it, just like I was talking about before with drawing and painting. Now we we have all of this. We can kind of take it all and and really finding what the anchor points are for for our own tastes and understanding can guide us through so much of what what is confounding. Uh, or antithetical to what we really find and cherish. Mm. Uh, and I think that's part of it, you know, being comfortable understanding that, you know, these marks that you love uh, may exist in something you, you you think is absolutely brilliant as well as something that's complete trash, right? And that that has to do with, you know, lots of different things. The context of how it's done, where it's done, how the artist employed stuff, uh, you know, and, and, and the skill, uh, you know, that they've, they've done it with. So... You know, I think that's that's my my concern more so. You know, and I I love the idea that you know I can uh, uh, be really intrigued and find a lot of meaning in in Andrew Goldsworthy or or somebody like Franz Klein when it's not what I do. It's not mm -hmm. 
you know, it's not my own thing, but I find it completely valid and lovely and beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not something that that is, is specifically in my wheelhouse in, in terms of what, what I do as a, as a painter mm -hmm. or as a drafts person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree that there's definitely, I just feel like it's perhaps all chaos in the present versus, you know, if you're, if you're talking about the French Academy, that was way too much order, you know? So it's like, I just, I would like it if there was some semblance of balance, you know? Um, and, and, and I mean, at the same time, you know, I can't deny, and, and I mean, I have mentioned it in previous episodes, I'm aware of the benefits of there not being a definition, of there not being so much control by some kind of entity on the art that is produced, because that's like, that's the reason for which I can draw and, you know, you can paint. That's why we can paint or draw whatever we want and sell it, you know, like we don't have to specifically make like a portrait of someone or like a out of the mirror and then hope that somebody wants uh, a portrait of somebody uh, like a rich person in like the court of a king or something. And then that's like maybe perhaps your entry into being able to live off of making paintings like portraits of rich people, you know, like the, the, the path isn't so specific that way. But then it's like at the same time, um, there's very, there's very little guidance in a way for an artist to find their way. And I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, I don't think so, because that just means that, I mean, you know, we're problem solvers, you know, in a, in a way you could, you know, there's overlap with engineering because it's like you're trying, you're resource, resource, resourcefulness, resourcefulness, you're trying to figure out, looking here, looking over there, see what works and whatever. Um, yeah, but, and I guess that's kind of like the balance that I liked at the Academy in a way, because, you know, that's part of like their motto or whatever, like um, traditional, uh, what was it? Contemporary discourse with, uh, what was the other thing? Traditional training or something? Something to that effect. That, yeah, that's yeah. kind of like what they sell, sort of. And that's like, all right, that's that's exactly what I was drawn to because they had the anatomy and the figure drawing and stuff, which, which you know, it's, it's arguably, perhaps that is like the foundational anchor, at least in terms of skill and technique, that it's like, you know, you learn how to draw or paint the you know the figure and like uh geometrical figures and perspective and this kind of very very solid foundational type stuff and then then you do whatever the hell you want you know and it's like some people argue that those are like deterrents but it's like they're totally not deterrents in the sense that like you know if you have oil painting for example and you don't know how it works your decisions are limited because you're limited to just stumbling your way but then it's like if you know how the how, how the material behaves it's like now you now you can choose whether the thing looks super splotchy or and uncontrolled versus if you make it like super tight or whatever it is it's like you have so much more to choose from you know like for example in my case it's like to this to this day uh i am not very good at drawing landscape or perspective or that kind of stuff for example and so it's like uh, my tendency is to draw, and Wade made fun of me for this, and it's really, I mean, I'm amused by it, because he's right. It's like, oh yeah, drawing uh, floating figures, no background, no composition and stuff, and it's like, that's absolutely the truth. Even even though, you know, centered floating things is also a composition, but the fact that I'm doing it because I don't have a choice, because I don't know how to do otherwise, that's it's different, see? So that's the difference between choosing to make the floating center thing versus doing it because I don't know to do anything else. I don't know how to make anything else. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, like I mean, that's important. An important yeah, difference. I mean, uh, not, not to, not to go too far down the Academy rabbit hole, but yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, when you think of, you know, the, the whole story about how, you know, Warhol helped found it, that was his concern. He felt limited as an artist because he mm. did not have a, 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 a vast knowledge of drawing, right? He felt very limited and thought that the skills, would be liberating to him. And he thought other artists should have them so that they can take it and go wherever they want. You know, and I'm, I'm fully on board with that. And I think that's still, you know, center to the mission at the Academy, you know, and, and with that, this, this idea of freedom. And this, this is something that I think that a lot of people overlook so much. It's like, oh, the old days where you could, you know, there, there is like a more tightly defined idea. Yeah, but if you didn't like painting religious pictures for churches or painting portraits of old dead rich guy, uh, white guys, 
you don't really have a lot of things you can paint and, and live off of and subsist off of. Now, yeah, you see everything under the sun. There, you know, it, it's absolute chaos, but everybody gets to make images that compel them. And that is so important. And that freedom is really lovely to have. You know, other times there there is almost some like subterfuge on, on some levels where, yeah, I'm, I'm doing this painting of, you know, uh, you know, of, of the descent from the cross, but I have to find a way into it. You know, there, there's a different restraint there from from kind of the traditional practices where you have patrons who are commissioning or whatever it may be. And now we can just go, well, I'm going to paint, you know, some ridiculous thing because I want to paint it and and maybe it will find a home with someone down the road. You know, and I think there's a great freedom in that and in yeah. finding those expressions. But with that, everybody's got that freedom. So that that's where I guess the that that Wild West kind of chaos of, of the modern day art scene really, you know, uh, can be baffling, infuriating, confounding and, and everything under the sun. But we shouldn't forget how lucky we are to be in it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely would rather uh, be free and like uh, have all of the risk that comes with it with that freedom freedom rather than than i don't know any degree of like what might be coddling or having something dictated for me sort of you know yeah um okay uh all right so what is beauty in your opinion hmm Be uh my opinion about beauty is is going to be very different and i think beauty is is typically you know, there, there is a certain subjective idea behind beauty and what is beautiful. To me, it, it, there's, again, for, for me, a painting that's going to be beautiful isn't necessarily going to be a painting that's pretty, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's going to be something that is compelling and something that resonates with me and, and reminds me of an aspect of my existence. You know, kind of coming back to what I was talking about before. And when we run into a painting like that or a drawing like that, that really speaks to us, that really strikes a chord. I mean, this can be music, this can be, uh, you know, virtually anything. It can be film, it can be, you know, name your medium of choice. And when you find yourself in those experiences, you know, uh, there, there's a gravitas, there's this feeling of weight of, of kind of the world. And when you get those moments, I find it beautiful, right? Um, to me, again, what what compels me and what I find beautiful, I can appreciate, you know, and I do very much uh, an artist like Raphael. You know, I, I think that he's absolutely magnificent and there is something very moving about him, but he has a very different worldview in my mind than somebody like a Peter Bruegel. And Bruegel has a much more absurdist understanding of the world around him. But I think that absurdity is something that I personally am totally compelled by. You know, that's that's the way that I interact with the world on so many levels where where the fact our the, the fact that our existence is riddled with just absolute absurdity and we're trying to find our way through it is is really kind of a lot of of what compels my own vision. And so, you know, somebody like Bruegel will resonate with me so much more in a museum where other people are going to go to some other artist that really kind of matches more of, of their experience of the world. Um, so, so for me, beauty just really is something that, that can strike that chord, you know, that really can, can push us past just seeing an image and going nice image versus, oh, that image is sticking with me and staying with me. And it's really getting me to contemplate or think about the bigger pictures, whatever that may be. And that, that's, that's what I think everybody goes for and really pushes towards as an artist is, is having those resonant chords with other people. Um, and we all do it in our own way. And, and when we can make those connections, when work can fall to other people and, 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 and compel them, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, I would like it if you went a little bit more into the absurdity that you were talking about with Bruegel isn't the, isn't there uh, with Bruegel isn't there uh, the elder and younger? Where am I, who am I thinking of? There is a gigantic lineage of Bruegels. So yeah, there's ah, Peter okay. Bruegel the elder. He's the one who's who's the most famous, I would say. You know, uh, overall, he had two sons: Peter Bruegel the younger and Jan Bruegel the elder. Jan Bruegel the elder 
uh, was known uh, more for landscape and floral and was very good friends with Peter Paul Rubens. But then there's a whole lineage after that of still life painters who were Bruegels uh, who kind of followed out through the Dutch Golden Age. So there, there, there's a bunch of them. They actually have an Abraham, uh, Abraham Bruegel at the Met still life uh, that, that's actually pretty lovely. Um, but, but Peter Bruegel is known for doing a lot of those more folkloric uh, landscapes. The, you know, uh, sometimes they, they, you know, the, the, the very Boschian in a lot of uh, ways, right? Where they're kind of more imagined and they can be hellscapes or, you know, uh, various other things like that. But he also has like his whole cycle of the months or of the seasons. Uh, they have the big, uh, the, the painting of August, the harvest painting at the Met, uh, which, you know, showcases so many things about Bruegel. And one of the things that's really beautiful about that painting and that, that we can look at is his understanding of the world and the absurdity of, of what it means to be human. And the way that I see this most clearly is that when we look at, at Bruegel, a lot of people see him as being kind of clumsy, you know, in terms of what he's doing. If you look at the landscape that he has painted in there, it is unbelievable. He may be one of the best landscape painters in the history of art. I mean, he has such a, a beautiful understanding of how to create these vast spaces that are compelling and moving uh, and have so much nuance in their character. And in front of it, he has placed these rugged peasant characters who are harvesting in the fields and they are clumsy and awkward and brutish uh you know and the language of his depiction of the figures is very different than the landscape and that speaks to perhaps his idea and concept of the earth being this kind of divine thing and the humans being kind of this imperfect mass of absurdity that's kind of existing on it so he kind of interplays those two and it's not just that he couldn't paint figures there's other paintings that he did uh, which really showcase how exceptional he is as a draftsman and a painter, mm. you know, uh, and, and he was no slouch whatsoever. And so he's making a very informed decision, it's I think, deliberate. in characterizing humans inside of uh, this this larger scope of, of the divine landscape. Okay. Um, what is absurd in, uh, I guess, I mean, do you, do you continue to, do you think uh, human being a human or humanity is absurd still in the present yeah but i don't think it's a bad thing i mean you 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 know we're all put on the planet we have a certain amount of time here which is way too short we die stupid things happen all the time to us right that's chaos we can't control so much of it you know there there's ironic moments there's things that happen non-stop that that just seem unfair or seem like fortuitous at all the wrong times whatever it may be and we're just sit here trying to pick up the pieces of it you know whether it's something that's lost something that's gained along the way and and there's not much control of it and not having that control creates this feeling you know in a lot of people of you know tragedy of whatever it may be but at the same time when we look at the larger scope of the world outside of ourselves uh, you know, there's so much. Uh, there, there's so much more, and so what happens to us is really so insignificant to the overall <laughs> effect of the world. Mm -hmm. That that if we have that understanding, we can see how absurd. You know, worrying about paying rent one month is when you know 50 years from now we may not even be here, or the next week we may not even be here. And so us having these crazy stresses, us having to navigate the world around us. When in reality, so much of it is is kind of constructed by ourselves and our own neuroses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a big part of it, and and that's something that I find really compelling, honestly. And it's not a direct thing that's shown necessarily in my paintings. I'm not painting political or narrative paintings. I'm mostly painting still lifes. Uh, but I really cherish the idea that you know the seriousness of the world around us is. is kind of a facade you know there, there's so much that uh there's so much beauty that really kind of comes when we understand that that you know the, this order and seriousness is, is something that we strive for but don't have and can't always you know uh, uh have uh when we want it um yes you know, the, your, what you were describing about the, what you were referring to as absurd in, ter in terms of like, what is absurd about humanity um, 
and worrying about paying rent and like everything that really feels very big within each individual. Uh, but then if you like zoom out and you look at Earth from space, it's like, I mean, to, I mean, to, because I, you know, I've thought about that before and I actually find what, what, what is it called? Um, there's a, an image that the Hubble took. It's a, a picture. Uh, they had the Hubble staring into a spot of the universe for like 11 days or something. And you know, for the light to get into it and stuff. So it, it had to like accumulate the image or something for, for waiting for the light to get into it. And it showed, it's called the, it's called the Hubble deep, ultra deep field or something. Um, and uh, just remembering it gives me goosebumps because it, it's like all the images, all the little dots of light, some of them are slightly bigger than others, but they're all like Milky Ways. It's like the milk, the, there's all, they're all galaxies. Um, and it's like, um, you know, I, so the idea that comes to my mind is that everything is just pointless. And that sounds depressive, but it, but I find it extremely liberating in the sense that like, it doesn't matter what I do, right? So I might as well do what I want <laughs> or something, you know? So, so then it's like, it, it's be, because in that view of not everything, because a lots of galaxies are not everything. There's like way more than that. So it's like, it's, you know, thinking about it in that, in that scale is like really, so you have like this macro scale and then it's like, when you get to us to like the individual, it's like so minuscule, yeah. Yeah. you know, but, but everything, everything feels so big within, within one, you know, Oh, absolutely. but then it's like, I don't know. I should remember that more often. I mean, my, my husband tells me often when I'm like worrying about shit, you know, just everything. It's like, everything is a reason for me to worry, but then it's like, He's like, you know, if you zoom out a little bit, he, like that's the term he uses. If you zoom out, zoom out a little bit, it's like, there's really, <laughs> it becomes like no reason to worry in a way. Yeah, yeah. It's not and that it, important. It's not, it's not. And that that's easier said than done for most Yo, of sure. us. And, and again, I think that's something that's actually magnificent about yes. being human. Uh, I, I still have... I'm still haunted by times when I've done something really stupid and seemed like a big deal to me, where it's like this instant regret of just saying a slightly wrong thing, mispronouncing a name in front of people, doing something that's like nobody remembers, nobody gives a shit about. Yeah. But to me, I've carried it for 20 years because it's something that that I just remember myself doing something wrong and uh, you know regretting the fact that I did something so stupid that nobody cares about. And again, as dumb as it sounds to me, that's something that I think is really lovely about humanity on some level. There's an absurdity to that, that we carry on all this information inside of ourselves that, that feels so big and so important, even if it's not. Mm -hmm. And that, that constant kind of push and pull there you know, really colors so much of our experience of the world and, and gives us all of this, you know, uniqueness to each individual. And I think it's really fascinating. And I don't want, like, you know, for me, I don't want to lose that. And that's why I don't like overly systematized painting. I don't like stuff that, you know, that, that individuality, I think, is so important, you know, yeah. when, when we look at anybody's work, you know, that's the last thing that I, as an educator, want to overwrite in somebody. Like, I don't want to, you know, and, and, you know, kind of, I guess, to go into a narrow field here, like when I'm looking at, uh, at, at students in their, their, near their drawings or, or the way that they're handling a brush, I don't like to overwrite their natural hand. I don't like to say, oh, well, this is the correct way of holding the brush to make this mark or anything like that, because there is a certain intuitive process to the way that people paint that creates a very unique uh, uh, hand, right? And that's why Michelangelo's drawings look like Michelangelo's drawings. Raphael's look like Raphael's. You don't want them both looking the same. Mm. You know, Plato may, because Plato liked the idea of a single ideal, right? This idea that there is one proper way of doing it. And that's, you know, that's perfection, man. I don't, 
I don't I don't have interest in that. I love seeing what what Michelangelo brings to the table versus somebody like a Rubens versus somebody else, you know, uh, like a Seurat in his drawings. Like that's fascinating to me and seeing these beautiful insights from different different, you know, different people in different eras is really the magic of it all. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's excellent. I think as a closure to the episode because we have broken the 50 minute mark. Uh, Mr. Zane York, so please tell our viewers and listeners what you're up to lately, where your work can be found, if you have an upcoming project that you're working on, anything you're excited about, anything you want to add. All right. Uh, well, um, my, my works are, are around, uh, you know, I, I, I'm represented by Gallery Flatermouse out of Chicago. Uh, also have works and work with galleries. Uh, like uh, I just had a show at, at Bain Art Gallery in Melbourne, Australia. Nice. Uh, Franklin Bowles Gallery in New York. Uh, so there, there's different places that, that, that you'll see my works around. Uh, obviously teaching a lot uh, at the Academy in RISD. Uh, so that's occupying my time. Right now, I'm happy to say that after about uh, two years of painting under deadline, I'm, I have some free space. So I'm getting some, some things together nice. and, and I'm starting to start, uh, start conceptualizing some larger works that I'm excited to get, get moving on in, in the coming months. Um, so I'll be around doing that. That sounds great. That's, that's awesome about not just that you have all of those uh, galleries and you have work showing in lots of places, but that, that now you, you get some res, respite or respite or like a break and you can chill a little bit. At that's least cool. focus my attention somewhere else, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's lovely. All right, so uh, thank you, Zane, for joining me. Thank you for your time, for your words and your thoughts. Thank you everyone for joining us. Feel free to let Zane and I know what you think of this conversation in the comments section. Also, I invite you to subscribe to my audiovisual channel because more of these conversations are coming. I also invite you to like this video and share it with any and all pertinent individuals. If you want to support Zane, myself, this podcast, or all three, the links will be in the show notes. So thank you very much, everyone, and see you next time. Thank you. Bye.